So if you don't mind, I think I'll, I'll just make a few opening remarks and then um, mm -hmm. you know, any time you have something to add, sure. go ahead. And if anyone ever has any questions along the way, don't hesitate to just, there's a panel discussion is what this is called. So um, at any point you can raise your hand or, or just you know, ask any questions you have. Um, <laughs> that's <just happy. laughs> and, um, so, um, I'm, I'm selling and buying a, a house right now, and so I'm very much aware of whether it's a buyer's market or seller's market, and um, in my personal opinion, um, students, it's a student's market out there for um, base schools. In other words, there are far more very good schools, very good teachers, than there are really excellent qualified base students. So if you prepare well as a prospective college student, you should be able to um, find a place to go and you should be able to get some a nice scholarship package because there are a lot of schools looking for good qualified bass players and there just aren't enough good ones. So uh, that's not to say that it's easy to get into elite schools because it's not. But that's what we'll be discussing today is, is how to prepare yourself and how to um, get towards that goal. Um, and the first thing that um, I think that we could discuss would be what to major in in, in college. There, there are three basic ideas would be uh, performance major, education major, and music therapy. Um, and so the performance majors, usually if you're a performance major, you're interested in maybe playing in an orchestra or teaching at a college later. And uh, if you're an education major, it's probably that you're going to teach in a public school. You might play in a regional orchestra outside, teach some private lessons. And then, then there's music therapy, which is, a, is another field um, that not all universities have, but some do. So I think um, that you want to make sure you know what, where it is that you, what program that you're interested in before you start looking at a school. Um, too seriously, do you have anything to add? <laughs> I mean, because to be honest, it's a little hard. I think it's something that's rarely talked about, what they major in, because students usually just show up to college auditions and, as music performance majors. And I think, I know sometimes, I also teach at the university, sometimes we listen to the person and we think, well, we can't really accept them as a music performance major. And so we just decline their application, uh, whereas we might have accepted them as a music ed major. Okay, can I yeah, can I try a couple of things here? Um, I would certainly agree with that. I'd add probably that one of the things that is very common uh, at many schools now is actually a double major. And I see and have seen more students who want to come and apply often as a performance major, and they say, and I also want to major in nuclear physics at the University of Rochester. I'm, I'm completely serious. Yeah, right. Engineering. Some certainly in the humanities, you know, while I'm thinking about creative writing or something like that, but a surprising number in the sciences. Um, I don't know if anyone in this room fits that model. <laughs> no, uh, are you the nuclear physicist? No, right there? I did environmental science, but okay. I drafted <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, that's actually, I think, a really interesting point because depending upon, and you remain in music, right? I finished my undergrad, yeah. Okay. In base, yeah. I, I never went like that, but that's really good. Okay. Um, but I think one of the things that's really very telling is that depending upon the choice of that double major and also what school you may consider doing that, it can work brilliantly or it cannot work at all. And there are dozens of factors that play into it, both the demands of that other major, because look, a lot of teenagers think, I want to study everything. And, and, and it's great that they have a sort of voracious appetite. They want to become a great instrumentalist, and they have this passion for electrical engineering. Um, and yet, there just isn't enough time to do both in many cases. And also, um, I'm certain we all agree, there is a window of time in which you can become a great instrumentalist. And you know, it varies a little bit, but you're not going to get the basics, frankly, when you're in your late 20s. It is too late. 
the window for really becoming a great instrumentalist is early. I mean, you can learn things in your late 20s and later, but to really have everything set to play at the highest professional level, it's early. That doesn't mean that there are other options. But um, I would just say that, you know, there are things. I have students who've done very well in double majors. They are very disciplined. They have great time management skills, and they're very perceptive. So it's, it often happens in kind of, at least at Eastman School, I will accept some double majors. I mean, a performance major and a music ed major is actually pretty common here. Um, but a performance major and something else that requires heading over to the University of Rochester, that's more complicated. Other schools in which that engineering major is on exactly the same campus could be less complicated. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm, I'm kind of coming at this from my own education and also now teaching <coughs> Peabody Conservatory kind of from the, um, you know, when I was 15, 16 years old, I knew I wanted to play in a professional orchestra. So all of my decisions about what schools to look at and teachers, it was all just sort of centered on like, okay, who, who are the best orchestral players? Who's winning auditions? You know, where are people, you know, where is all this stuff happening? And just, it all kind of funneled and I would say a lot of the students that were at Boston University, where I did my undergrad, and also at Rice University, where I did my master's, were kind of, you know, you know, personalities and people that had different backgrounds. But for the most part, there was a similar kind of approach to, okay, we're all going to become great orchestral bassists to some degree, and then we'll see where that takes us. Some people wanted to take auditions right away, and others, you know, would maybe go study with Francois for a couple years, or would, um, would. Uh, or someone like Jeremy Kurtz, who was, you know, living in California, and then went to New World, and you know, and then he went and did the master's degree. Um, there, there's a lot of different ways to do that. So I think when I see this here, that there's three options for me. I knew I wanted to be a performance major in college when I was in high school, and I already had teachers who were doing that. So it was sort of like you're studying with someone who's also living the career that you're trying to eventually get into, so you can have some direct experience with it. So my whole world is sort of centered around that, and now I'm doing the same thing, playing in a major orchestra, teaching in a conservatory. But it's interesting what you're saying, because Johns Hopkins does have a lot of those same options in terms of if a student wanted to sort of expand their diet of classes, they can do that, but they have to get on a bus and go leave the conservatory campus and take a 10 minute bus ride over to Hopkins, which it's not that far away, but you start kind of adding up all the time and, and it, you, you see that most of the students end up kind of needing to focus on their music yeah. and, and if yeah. they do, they will, they will be fine, right. they'll get through the degree, they'll get all their recitals and all of their um, classes taken care of. So I mean, that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. and. Um, I think that the, the other thing I would add to that is that, you know, Derek mentioned that, you know, there are elite schools or places where, you know, Curtis Rice, you, however you want to think of it, you can read talk base or if you know people who have gone to certain schools that uh, have been successful, I mean, being successful is, is you know, I guess in your own perception. Um, but uh, I would say the performance part maybe is very competitive, mm -hmm. and you know, when I took the National Symphony audition, there were 135 bass players that were there. These are people who are currently in school, people who are graduating, people who have been in an orchestra for years, people who um, live locally, and oh, there's an audition down the street. I mean, it's like everybody's showing up. So if you're thinking about becoming a performance major, everything that's leading you towards that needs to be seriously considered, the choice of teacher, and um, um, just understanding what the expectations are, and, and it's not to scare you, but, um, you know, sure, even when I was in high school, I was like, oh, I want to do this, but you still have to go through the process of studying and learning the music and, yep. and filtering all the things that you're going to learn so that you can go that path. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't say that deciding what you're going to do for the rest of your life needs to happen when you're 16, but it's just, it's good to check in with yourself and also with yeah. your teachers to know yeah. where that's going to lead you because I've seen people, I mean I just went and saw Ali as and Far Play Recital and he did a physics degree at Johns Hopkins and, and ended up becoming a, you know, 
performance? If I can jump in here, I have a very different route. Um, I've been at the school for many years, and I think you um, can probably attest to the fact that things have changed very dramatically uh, from the time I went to college. Um, and most of the students that come here as performance majors, and that is the bulk of the students that I have in my class currently, um, follow much the same sort of model that I just described. My own model is rather different, albeit pretty convoluted. Um, I'm a high school dropout. Um, I quit playing, I'm sorry, I quit high school so I could play full-time at principal base in Canada. I've been playing <laughs> even in high school with the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, so I wasn't in high school very much anyway. That was kind of, yeah. Um, but I went to school uh, basically at the University of Buffalo to study with the Cleveland Quartet. But again, it was the same thing. It was the notion of I was attracted to a teacher. I'd been studying when I was not in school um, with other teachers to learn how to become a better orchestral player and also how to become a better solo player. Both things were very current for me. Um, but when I did finally return to school and finally <laughs> get a college degree, um, my interest was actually um, having something that probably would not be possible now and probably not possible with most major music schools, and that is that I had a minor in history. I actually have a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. So I had a very different background, but again, it was because I, I turned pro when I was 15, so I had a very different sort of experience. That is not going to happen, at least in this country these days. Um, but. I think having had a sort of different collegiate experience, particularly a very different collegiate experience than what happens here at Eastman, um, gives me a little different appreciation for those few folks like Ali Asenfar who can major in this and yeah. do that. It is not It is possible, but those are those folks are generally the exception rather than the rule. Yeah, me. no, that's good. Yeah. Um, so then the next item would be to decide you know, which schools to apply to, and so um, I had my students make this little chart, and I said, great, and this is just a, a sample. This is not anyone's actual chart. And I made up these universities. It started out XYZ, then turned into the, yeah, thanks. Um, I got carried away at the end. Um, <laughs> but that's the one I went to. <laughs> and, uh, but basically, somewhere along the line, as a junior, I think uh, is a, when you're a junior or a sophomore, that would be a good time to go around and, and meet other meet teachers, look at classes, start thinking about which schools you want to try to, to narrow it down to. And when I talk to juniors in high school who are interested in pursuing music, um, if they have 10 schools on their list, I'm fine with that. But it's pretty soon, you want to narrow it down to about five, because realistically, you're going to be visiting all these schools to take uh, you know, personal auditions and private lessons with the teachers. And um, you don't want to have more than five, because it's, it's just too much to deal with, and the application fees and, and everything. So try, I mean, five is, is, is a good number. Obviously, you don't want one. <laughs> Sometimes students say, well, I really want to go to this school, and that's it. But that's not a good idea for obvious reasons. And um, and, but I like making these charts, um, and I, I like to have the students make these charts because it's it's good to see it all lined up like this, and, and it helps you organize the audition dates. You can make one trip maybe and catch two or three auditions with one trip. Can I add one? Yes, thing? please. Um, I made my students this year because I had two high school seniors, and they were auditioning for more than five schools. So they, they made a list like this, but they also added a column that had deadlines for accommodation letters, so that I knew yeah, that when I needed to get my letters into certain schools, and the dates were completely different. It's right. Like one's due in December, and one's due in March. So that was very helpful. And some of them, were, you would do them online, some of them you needed to send an actual letter. So be sure to do your homework about what every school, it seems there's more of a push to do things online, but some places are still doing yeah. old-fashioned. Yeah, this Common App is great. Right. Yeah. <laughs> common App is wonderful. Yeah. If, if I could add, well, before you create your list, the, the students should check out the university, because all of us know, like, I want to go to Juilliard or I want to go to Rice. But when you decide, like, how many ensembles are there, how many graduate students are there, you know, like, at, some, at many schools, like the best orchestra, the first 
four chairs for the grad students, so the undergraduates might not get a chance to play with the top conductor. Um, many larger universities, um, only the best students get to study with that big name marquee teacher that's going there. So if you're thinking you're going to pay $40,000 a year to study with uh, Mr. Bottasini, and Mr. Bottasini only teaches four hours a week and he teaches the doctoral students. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's, that's the thing that a little bit of, um, you, can, you can find that out pretty easily, you know, and if, if you're going to a university that's in this town, and the teacher there is the principal base in, in that town, and they're yep. three or four hundred miles away, you know, like, like we all know there, I mean, there are a lot, lots of teachers whose um, their skills are, are such that they're really highly valued. You know, I know a teacher in New York who teaches in Florida. You know, so if, if you're the type of student who's at, who's at the point that he needs weekly contact with his teacher, you know, saying that I want to study with this great teacher and I can get into this school in Florida, you know, although it seems like a great solution for you, you know, you might be disappointed when, when you get there. So that's some things that you should think about also. That's a wonderful point. I think depending upon what level and what age the student is at, Having the real proximity, the close contact with the teacher is absolutely imperative. And the circumstance for many teachers in many schools, I mean, it's, it's all over the map, as, as Douglas is pointing out. But certainly for younger students, I think you have to be kind of mindful about who's going to be there to see you and how often, particularly for the price tag that you may be asked to pay. So um, it's, it's a very critical thing. So. Yeah. Well, I'll just add to that. I mean, I, I feel like I kind of fit a little bit of what you're talking about. I mean, this year I'll have five students at Peabody. Um, I also teach at Catholic University. It's a much smaller music program. Um, there, since I'm the only teacher there, there, aren't, there isn't like a cat. At Peabody, we have three teachers. There's one full-time teacher who carries about 12. And then Jeff Weiser and I each teach anywhere from three to five. So I would say at any for every given year, Jeff and I are maybe only accepting one student. So it's extremely competitive to get into our studios. Um, but, but it's sort of like students who end up going there, whether they study with Paul or whether they study with Jeff or myself, it's a win-win because we team teach the repertoire classes. So we, we all teach the orchestra rep equal. And Paul is there all the time. And there's a certain amount of, um, I guess, a luxury for any of the students that you have a teacher that's there. So it isn't like all the teachers are at them for part time, but but it is important just to know what you're what you're getting into and, and to to ask. I mean, people will ask me how many opens do you have, and usually I say I don't really know. Maybe maybe one, maybe two. So it's yeah, it's important just to know because you may not want to fly your base across the country if the teacher says I don't really have any openings this year. Um, maybe you do. Maybe you want to check out. Maybe you want to take a lesson with all the teachers and keep your options open. Um, choosing the repertoire, that's one of the categories on here. Um, and that's again, you know, that will probably be somewhat the same from, for all five schools. I and mean, you have to look at the auditions requirements for each particular school because every once in a while some, some of them will have something very specific. Like sometimes they will say two movements of Bach. So you want to make sure that, that you have that covered. Um, some schools, um, there's a famous school in New York that specifically says that you have to play the Baroque Sonata. And they, they actually don't want a box, so, um, so, you, so it's very important that you um, to look at those requirements and, and make sure that you have the right material. Um, I get emails um, for students applying all the time, I'm sure you guys get this too, asking what they should play. And um, <laughs> I always email back, so, you know, people I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, obviously, you have to consult with your teacher that you see on a regular basis because you know I don't know who you are and know what you can play and what what you play is not nearly as important as how you play and I usually say that and that's what I'm saying right now um, I think we all agree um, and so I wouldn't get overly concerned with what you play as long as you're meeting the requirements of the school um, it's certainly not it's certainly not more impressive to play a very difficult piece if you don't play it well Right. Um, so, um, by that same, I mean, it's, it's rare that someone plays something that's beyond um, or lower than their ability. I personally find because, I mean, really everything is hard if you're going to really play it well. Yeah. So, um, 
So it, it's important to choose repertoire that really makes you sound good, that puts you that puts your best foot forward, and uh, and that's that's with all the the solos and the orchestral excerpts. With the orchestral excerpts, if I have a chance with students, I like to have them prepare maybe as many as ten orchestral excerpts in, in their sophomore and junior years, and then I can kind of get a, a feel for which one or two they play best. And, and so sometimes I don't have that luxury. If I only have them for a shorter period of time, we may have to just prepare one or two, and that, that, those will be their excerpts. But in a more ideal situation, I find that high school students might play, especially when it comes to Mozart, that they might play something, for instance, Mozart 39th symphony. They might have a good spectacle with that lick in the first movement of that piece. Um, and they may have more trouble with uh, the, the Mozart 40 first movement. That, that somehow the speed of the spiccato, um, that they, they can't do that, but they can do the 39. Um, sometimes a, another little trick of mine, I hope these two guys don't, they're not on my tricks now, but I have another trick. <laughs> My hey, students, it's free. I have, <laughs> I, have another, I have another trick that I do with students who don't have a really good spiccato, but can play really, really fast, and that is to play Mozart 35 in the first movement, because um, that can be very impressive. And uh, or the last movement, I'm sorry, last movement is what I'm thinking. The last movement that can be very impressive, uh, and it's really not off the string because it's so darn fast. But they can really whip that off, and they, you get credit for playing Mozart, and you don't really have to play spiccato. So, but you don't know those kinds of things. Right. You don't know those kinds of things unless you really have ten excerpts to choose from. Um, it's also very, very true with the um, uh, Beethoven excerpts. You know, there's a very big difference between playing Beethoven seven and Beethoven five, the, the excerpts, and so uh, that's why it's good to have. Um, at least a, a pull of about 10 of them that you can kind of play pretty well so that you can see which ones really make you sound best. But what you're also suggesting is that as you're going through this pool of excerpts mm -hmm. with your students, you will be advising them. Yeah. I, I know Derek does this because he's sent a fair number of students my way. Um, you'll be advising them on what they do best because I think that what he suggested is so critical that you want to show what you do best not what is the hardest or the fastest piece, necessarily. Um, I remember some auditions from some of my, uh, my more prominent students, and frankly, at that level, age 17 or 18, I've heard a variety of things. So for example, Jeff Turner, who many of you know is principal of basic history, his audition was the first movement of the Capuzzi chair. Okay. Now, today, that's considered pretty simple. Jeff Turner played that piece extremely well. Um, he had barely worked in the thumb position. Again, that's, mm -hmm. again, and Tom Spur, who was in Cleveland, I think played at Eccles. On the other hand, Young Chow Wei, whom you'll hear tonight, I think played maybe second woman of Botticini. And, well, okay, very, <laughs> very well. Right, and, and it'll go on from there. You'll hear somebody tonight, Brett Shirtliff from Buffalo, who played uh, third and fourth movements of Eccles. So it's not necessarily that one is going to have off the charts spectacular virtuosity. The other thing, frankly, that I find for most students that audition for me is, and this is sort of a, giving you kudos, their excerpts are really pretty weak. And um, one of the reasons that I find excerpts so intriguing to hear at auditions is not just to sense what sort of experience that a student has had in playing in orchestra, but actually to have a sense of other musical things that they do. So can they count well? <laughs> Can they keep time really well? Because often, regrettably, for younger students, they learn solos and excerpts in a very different fashion. And not necessarily the best different fashion. And so it's kind of intriguing to hear that. Not to say that things can't change, because things do change. You go to school, basically, to change, to get better, right? And I think that that's, that's sort of one of the things that comes in. 
But when I hear somebody who plays a, a well-prepared solo, not a difficult one, but an excellent excerpt, I think, aha, here is someone with real potential. There's good intonation, there's solid bow control in a variety of strokes. Most all of the solos that are played, by the way, for freshmen, it's all very symmetrical, right? It's in twos and threes, and it's very interesting. But you play even sort of standard excerpts, they're not symmetrical. The technique just does not work the same way. So you sense that there's a little bit more, perhaps, basis of growth. Yeah, I, I think that's great. And I would add to that that, you know, this idea that, oh, you're going to learn excerpts or you'll, you'll delve into that repertoire when you get to college. I mean, if you mentioned it earlier that becoming a great string player needs to happen basically as early as possible. So if you're in, if you're in youth orchestra, or your, your teacher, I mean, almost every bass player, even if they're not playing in, in an orchestra, knows orchestral literature. I and mean, we all do, we all study the, um, you know, just say, I want to learn Mozart 40, or I want to learn Beethoven 5, and even if it means you just work on one movement for three months, I mean, I've done that with my students. We just study together a piece of music, not just the excerpts for their auditions or for, you know, region or all state or something like that, but actually, like, let's turn the recording on and listen to the piece, and then let's let's talk about what's going on, so that you're you're starting to sort of digest and understand this music. So when you go to play just three lines of it, you already are taking on some of the musicality and the style. And, and along with that, I, I feel like a lot of students play their excerpts that match the solo technique. So I'm hearing a lot of Otello and yeah. Beethoven 9 recitatives, which are great. You need yeah. to know those because they're on almost every major audition. But I, I don't see as much of the bow technique and strokes. And, and like Derek said, that was easier. It yeah. doesn't need it's to be easy. off the string. Yeah. But I mean, even just, you know, even some of the Tchaikovsky or Dvorak or, <laughs> or some other things that maybe, I mean, Beethoven, Mozart, Brahms, Strauss, we think of those as being like the pinnacle of. You know the most, the greatest music and the greatest music, based for the bass parts and also the most difficult. But there are plenty of other pieces that you have to play um, that that you could sort of get some of that same stuff. So I would explore slow orchestral music, fast orchestral music, medium, on the string, off the string, have those conversations um, with your teacher. Um, and again, like I said, you need to know Tello and Beethoven 9, but I, I, it seems like some students haven't gotten outside of that. Um, so, yeah, don't, don't wait. Okay, um, um, the next thing on my outline is um, where the audition would take place and you know, what you should wear. I think, personally, just to be comfortable. I mean, I, I wouldn't wear jeans, maybe in you know, nice dress pants, but you don't have to wear a suit if you're a male. You, you certainly don't have to wear a dress if you're a female or high heels. I think you want to be look respectable but not but comfortable by the same token. And um, <laughs> I'm sure we've seen everything. <laughs> And more. And more. <laughs> I mean, don't wear sweats <laughs> and flip flops, okay? Because uh, yeah. And um, oftentimes it's uh, the string faculty. So it's usually you're auditioning for two or three people, or four or five. Um, it depends on the school. Sometimes it's just, if it's a large bass department, it may be all the bass players. Um, in some schools, the conductor is there. A lot of times the school, uh, the conductor will be there. Sometimes it's a room similar to this. Sometimes it's a teacher's studio. Uh, well, I can just interject. The Eastman School, you only audition for me. And the audition takes place in my studio. Yeah, so at, at Peabody, is it, is it the same? It's just the three of us. Just the these fall yeah. downs in studios. Right. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, I mean, right. I would say it's casual, but, but it's, yeah. it, you know, it's not as formal as it would be playing for right. nine screwing right. teachers. The interesting thing is that I always try to make a student who's coming in feel comfortable. But invariably, the circumstance, <laughs> as you can imagine, for most high school seniors, it's actually pretty intimidating. And uh, some people will say, you know, in fact, it's fairly common to say, my gosh, I I'm so nervous. And my job at that point yeah. is to try and calm everybody down to make sure that they play their best and feel comfortable. Because as a momentary segue, yeah, no, please. One of the most important things is not just you know, how you select the school and you look at X, Y, and Z, but you have to keep in mind that although you can always transfer, 
the goal here in getting to a school and advancing your career is also establishing a personal relationship with someone for four years. It's a long time. And that's kind of a two-way street, right? But it also, I think, is, is kind of imperative on me as a faculty member that I want to make certain that I'm available in a whole lot of different ways, not just as someone who's going to give them a prospective student a great base education, but also as a mentor. Sometimes I have to act as a parent. Um, and a lot of, I mean, really, it's a four-year commitment. You can change it. It's not like getting married. But, <laughs> but you can also change it. I screwed that up. Um, but, but the idea is that you've got to understand that you've got, you're going to be pretty close to somebody for four years. And your career and a lot of your musical life is to some extent entrusted into their hands. So I think one of the important things is to choose wisely. I think the other thing, that, yeah, we'll probably get to it, but it also depends upon the environment that you're going to be in. And the environment is not just playing in the orchestra. It, who else is going to be in the studio? What will your colleagues be like? What, what's the atmosphere like? Are people friendly? Are they supportive? Is it a stab in the back situation that you know you play, you know, you have a bad day playing in studio class that everybody's going to make fun of you, or what? Because frankly, also every school is different yeah. on that front, and I think it's very important to understand what kind of environment you're going to get into to advance your. Well, um, let's jump down to um, the actual decision. And um, I always tell my students, and it happened my very first year of teaching in high school um, in Interlochen. Um, one of my students got all excited about getting accepted to one of the schools. And so he sent the letter back saying yes. And, and then uh, another school accepted him. And, and, and well, I'd rather go to that one. And <laughs> it was a big, huge mess. <laughs> and um, I think he was collecting his acceptances and, and just thought he could just say yes to all of them. But um, it was actually very, very difficult. Lawyers got involved and um, so don't do that. <laughs> Make sure that you, once you say yes to a school, um, that's it. Um, and so um, it seems very obvious to me, but it, it's not obvious to everyone. And um, you, can, you can change your mind, but it's not easy at all. <laughs> and it can get legal. So, um, especially when, if you've accepted scholarship. So, um, so make sure that you know, the magic dates as they come around in, uh, in March, you start to find out from schools. And sometimes they send it via email, sometimes it's a um, letter. And um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an exciting time when you get the acceptances or declines. But, uh, and then sometimes it's a, uh, you know, you get waitlisted to schools, and so there's all kinds of things that can happen, and maybe uh, the panel can shed some light on this. But uh, my first, the first um, course is to make sure that you don't, don't jump the gun <laughs> and, and just say yes, and make sure you have all the schools in mind before you uh, start thinking about which ones. And you can, I think it's possible to ask for more scholarship money um, if, if, it's, if that's the reason that you're not going to go to a particular school. I encourage all my students to have real personal relationships with the actual base teacher. And so email contact, which was established a year before the actual audition, and so that you can actually email the teacher. And if you're accepted but didn't get enough scholarship money, you can email the teacher and say that specifically and get the dialogue going. So, please. Yeah. No, 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 uh, I, I would also like to confirm that Derek's students have been absolute models of communication while in high school. So that I've got them, you know, mm -hmm. emails yeah, right. and established relationships. That's absolutely the way to do it. Because I understand, first of all, that they are serious about this. Mm -hmm. that, they, uh, that they also have enough maturity to be able to communicate. Because frankly, a lesson is an exercise in communication, right? If they can show that they've got that sort of uh, presence to be able to do it, hey, that certainly makes me more inclined. Yes? I might add, like, um, you're talking about performance-based scholarships. 
But very often when I meet a kid when he's in 10th grade, the first thing that I'll ask him is, how are your grades? What type of, like I'll even ask him, what type of citizen are you? Because many universities, they want to get these high profile students. So very often I'll get a student who has like great grades, great SATs. Um, he's got a really high class rank. And before I can even write the letter, to the scholarship committee saying, I think that this is a base part that you might want to think about. The university has already offered him like a trustee scholarship or a presidential right. scholarship Absolutely. because they love it when USA or US News and World Report comes out that they say, you know, we get our profile student, you know, he's got SATs that are 1800, he's top 10% of his class. So you want to also make sure that in addition to bugging the base teacher about can I get a little bit of money, you want to be in touch with admissions because mm -hmm you're developing a relationship with them and very often they're the gatekeepers more than the base teacher. You know, like yeah. you'll accept a student Far more so. and his SAT <coughs> score is five points below and you won't find out about it until two days before the deadline to try to find out if you can, you know, do something to help that student to get into the university beyond playing base. I try to get to have some knowledge of the background of the student fairly early on. And um, I think Eastman certainly wants to have students who have some academic ability. I, I think every school does. Uh, Peabody with its time with Johns Hopkins. I mean, we're all kind of in the same boat. I will occasionally make exceptions. Mm -hmm. And I think, since I'm the poster boy of high school drama, um, <laughs> I did go to college, and I actually graduated by a lot But, um, you know, I also understand that people go through different things at different times. And, um, you know, I found out, for example, that, you know, somebody's grades have taken a total nose out while their parents were getting into this. You know, that happens. I mean, teenagers, young people go through a lot of stuff. All of us go through a lot of stuff. And it means that things will change during their lives. And sometimes it's real easy, I'm certain you do the same, we go over to our admissions office and say, yeah, 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 this guy is, person's got gazillions on their SATs. And other times we go over and say, this person has been completely involved in the double days because everything else in their life has you know, gone down the tubes, but you see potential there. So I will, I will go over and lobby for that sort of person. And sometimes it's been the most phenomenal musical and personal payoff you could imagine. But what you just said is frankly more common. You want to be able to keep mm -hmm. grades up at a slightly different level, um, but we'll give you also an illustration. You want to both sort of follow the guidelines, not only for the repertoire, but also for the other stuff that you need to submit to the school. Um, this will not apply, apply, I think, to many of you who are, looks to be prospective undergraduates. But not long ago, um, I had a, a master's applicant um, who played really very well, and very bright guy, kind of quirky, okay? And he said, well, I'm going to be applying to your school. And, I, and he said, I'm going to have a little bit of an issue about submitting um, a writing sample. And this guy was already attending a major, well-known university with a fine-based part. Okay, we'll leave it at that. But anyway, what happened was that this fellow ended up writing as his uh, writing, submitting rather, as his writing sample, um, the th sort of five to 10 page paper that he had to write as part of his DWI conviction. I'm, I'm not making this up. So you can imagine that even though the playing was, was pretty good, our admissions and graduate office looked at this thing, and this is an academic paper, and I mean, it was really pretty well written, and I guess you could imagine that this kind of bearing of the soul, you know, I got arrested for the DWI and I spent a few days in jail. Well, well right, so he, he but, isn't here. And so you just use common sense also about where this will go. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. Does anyone have any questions?
Yes. Yeah. So, so what's the difference between uh, an undergrad and a grad student? You know, what do you think for their auditions? Is it just a higher level, graduate level, or? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm looking for someone at a graduate level who's really targeting as a performance major a professional career soon, and um, they've got to be really pretty advanced musically, technically. Because you, there, you've got two years with them if they're a master's student, and it depends, you know, what they're going to do. But uh, having said that, um, some of my master's students, um, there is certainly a number who are very much. The majority will generally be targeting very specific orchestral career, and that's what we do. I will have occasional folks these days who are targeting contemporary music careers which is a sort of interesting way, but they have other skill sets. Having said that, they're usually some of the finest orchestral players there are, but I do also, particularly with grad students, a lot of contemporary direction. Yeah, do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Um, I would say, I'm, for me, I'm looking for the same qualities. I think the difference is that the person who's going to grad school has already decided that they have a focus and they're basically already bringing that focus to the table. And then your job as a teacher is less about teaching them you know, a bow stroke and more about helping them fulfill whatever dreams they're trying to pursue. Um, you know, when, when people come in and they're 18, a lot can happen in four years. They think they want to do this, they realize they have another skill set. They go from, you know, they, they add a minor, they take away their, one of their double majors, or they transfer to different school. A lot of things happen. I think the job as an undergrad is to help them become a, you know, a successful person, a good student, um, to try to help them grow up. Because when you're going from you know, living in one place for 18 years with your family to being on your own, um, for some students that can be very difficult. Um, so yeah, I agree, it's not just the base education, but grad students, uh, prospective grad students, usually they already kind of know what they want to do, and, um, and you just want, you want to help them get there, because yeah, two years goes by really quickly. Great. Any other questions? Yes? Um, for a high schooler, should the emphasis um, for college auditions and actually getting to an elite school um, should there be more emphasis on the orchestral excerpts or the solo playing? Well, you'll, one of the things that you want to see is that you want to play well. And I think we both, I really probably agree, we want to see what sort of potential you have. Um, having said that, the uh, requirements for most schools ask for both. Yeah, right. And I think one of the important things <clears throat> is to look at those requirements and they will have, in fact, you listed this stuff here. I mean, there are a bunch of things. And look at the different schools. They'll all actually have fairly similar things, which means right. looking at a balance of skills, we hope that the applicant can represent. Right. Yeah. I've got, got, if, yeah. if, if you're auditioning, if I, if I could add, like I, yeah, I, I, teach, teach. I teach at a university full time. And um, when the string faculty's at the audition, you know, the other person that's in the, in the room is the conductor. Here. And when you go to a school, um, the only person who's going to hear you play solos for the most part is your teacher. Um, so um, when the orchestra conductor hears, hears, hears you play, he wants to know the first day of school, are you going to be a good, good person when she comes to the school? Yeah. Um, if, if you come from like a, a school that has a great band program and you're not averse to playing in the wind ensemble or the concert band, again, this is stuff that like kind of adds gold to your um, application. You know, like um, the band director at my school just became the dean of the college. And any bass player that's willing to play in his wind ensemble gets his name moved up about eight notches on the scholarship. I mean, yeah. like, if you, you, like if you were to write down that you play oboe as your secondary instrument at a lot of colleges, you know, maybe not at the elite universities, but a lot of colleges today have um, a lot of trouble finding double read players. So you might um, get into the studio, but what's going to get you the scholarship money is that um, you'll play early music or you're willing to play yeah. oboe or something like that. Um, one school that I used to teach at actually gave money to people who played in the marching band. 
Yeah, well, and yeah. I mean that was like, I mean, you know that you're not doing it in May, so you know for you, for a four month commitment you're getting like like tuition help for the full year. Yeah, I, I think it's premature to be a high school student and, and try to specialize in solo line or orchestral yeah. line. Um, I mean, you can have a passion for one, and, yeah. and people usually tell you that you know you'll hear comments, oh, you're more of a soloist than an orchestral player, but you really um, you're too young at, at the high school level to yeah. know what you'll end up doing. Um, those are the kinds. Of, even as an undergrad, it's the verdict's still not out. But as you become in, in the grad school, that's when you start to see. You know, you maybe you take an audition, you do pretty well. Okay, maybe the orchestra is where you're going. Uh, you win concerto competitions two or three times. Maybe, maybe you have some solo potential. And, and you might want to teach at a university and go that route. So. All right. Great. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.